study. God in heaven, we ask that you would guide us, that you would teach us, and that you would inspire us. Lord, we ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, because you are my strength and you are our Redeemer. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. When I worked as a youth pastor, every year I would get a group of kids, a, a van load of them, and we would truck them off into the Appalachian Mountains, and we would repair homes for families that needed it. I called it Mission to the Mountains. And it was a cheap way to do a mission trip so that as many kids could go, and we didn't have to go overseas and cost a lot of money. So we would trek up into the mountains, and every year, in order to keep costs low, because that was the plan, keep costs as minimal as possible. We did the mission trip every year for $100 a kid, and we'd go for four or five days. So it was tight, tight, tight budget. And one of the things that I did to keep the budget low was to tell the kids, make sure and have supper before you come. We're leaving at 6 o'clock. Eat before you come. You're not going to get any supper tonight. So eat before you come. That way I don't have to pay for that. Remember? Tight, 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 tight budget. And so we would get there and all the kids would pile into the 15 passenger van. Of course, I'm driving. Remember? Tight budget. Can't pay for anybody else to come. And so I'm driving the bus and we're driving along and we're going up through the Appalachian Mountains and we'd be driving like 30 minutes max. And kids would start saying, Pastor Albert, I'm hungry. We just passed a Taco Bell. Or Pastor Albert, I'm hungry. We just passed who knows what. Can we please pull over? And I would say, did you eat before you came like the form said you had to? Ugh, not really. Well, what did you have for supper? Oh, I don't know, like some spaghetti and some vegetables and then like some leftover pasta and then like some other vegetables and then some bread but not really and I'd say you did eat supper we're not pulling over we have a schedule we have to be there in reality I just didn't want to pay for it we got to keep moving and the kids would say inevitably they would come up pastor Albert we're teenagers we have needs Ah, uh, teenager needs. All that did was steal my white knuckles around the steering wheel and we would push through. I'd throw some sesame seeds into the back for them to eat. <laughs> needs. How do we deal with needs? And what is our relationship to needs? All of us, we have, we, you've heard whole sermons, you've heard whole presentations, you've heard whole seminars on needs versus wants. Some things are wants. A new car, that's a want. Need, that's water. You know, we're familiar with the idea of needs versus wants. And when we come to our series on Nehemiah, we find somebody that is beginning to engage with needs in a way that we want to learn something from. As we started this last week, we're going to be going through this series on Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a towering figure in scriptures. Nehemiah has a very important place in the scripture because get this, as we talked about this last week, where Nehemiah fits in the chronology of the written word of the Old Testament, many of you might be not surprised by this, but maybe not aware of this, but do you realize that when we get to the last words of Nehemiah at the end of the book of Nehemiah, not one more word would be written until we get to the New Testament. This is the last words of the Old Testament. Now some scholars debate a little bit with a couple of other words of Malachi and a couple of other th different things. But we can suffice to say that this is at the end. The closing of the Old Testament. And so even though Nehemiah doesn't figure in at the end of all of the books, he's somewhere closer to the middle in the way that he's stacked in there. In fact, the date that it was written was at the end. You guys are familiar that the books are not ordered chronologi chronologically, right? You guys are familiar with that? Job was not written right before Psalms. You guys are familiar with that idea? Okay. So, Nehemiah was, they say, is one of the last books, if not the last book, written. So we find the story of Nehemiah. It's almost like, man, this is the last words of the Old Testament. This is the last song and testament. This is the closing words of that period of Scripture. And the Bible chooses to have the last testament of Nehemiah as an indelible testimony for that period. 
So let's go with the book of Nehemiah. And if you get anything out of the book of Nehemiah as we study, I hope you get the word of God out of the book of Nehemiah because we're going to read every single word out of Nehemiah through our study. Amen? And for those of you that don't get our newsletter, avail of yourself of our newsletter. Each week over the course of this study, I'm going to be sending out a pre-sermon outline. Did anybody get it this last week? I know how many clicked through because we have it on constant contact, so I don't want to see 45 hands up. But we're going to be including the outline with each um, newsletter each week, and you'll get an outline for you to study with your family. This last week, my wife and I, we made it as one of our morning studies. We got up early, we took the outline, and we went through it together as a family preparing for this week's sermon. So when I send out that outline, take a moment with your kids, with your husband, with your wife, or with yourself, and go through the outline, and be familiar with the Word of God before we come here to study. It'll add another layer of blessing. So that'll be as a part of each newsletter I send out each week. Beginning in verse 2, well, beginning in verse 1, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, it happened in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the capital. Now, when is the month of Chislev? Anybody familiar with that? Of course you're not. It's the month of December. It's during our winter period. So imagine this is during the winter, dark and dreary days of the year. And it happens in Susa, the capital. This was Paris. This was New York City. This was the central part of the then known civilization. Or at least one of them. Did my voice get really weird all of a sudden? Okay. This was the central area, and it's during the winter time. And he says that at that time, Hananiah, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem, and they told me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Now what's broken down? I need to hear you. The, the lights mess up the sound. What is broken down? the wall. And its gates are destroyed by fire. By what? Fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O oh Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servants, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the people. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though you dispersed be under the farthest skies, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servants today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Amen. And the Bible includes this description. Now, I was a cup bearer. Now, that tells us a little bit about who he was. I'm, I'm getting confused with the feedback Sorry. Did you guys change something? All right. Now I was a cup bearer. What does that tell us about him? What position did he hold in the kingdom? Was it a, was it a servant, a general servant in the house of, of the king? No, he was a very important person. The cup bearer would take any piece of juice, any piece of wine, any piece of fruit, any piece of food, any entree, and he would taste it first before the king. People want to poison the king, it's going to go through Nehemiah first before it gets to the king. He was a very important person. The king would eat things only after Nehemiah said it was okay to eat them. Now if you would imagine with me, this person is going to be near the king a lot of the time. 
Did the king only eat three square meals throughout the day? Probably not. He probably snacked. I imagine Nehemiah was around him all the time. In fact, some scholars say that he would have possessed a greater amount of influence than any of the king's cabinet or trusted advisors. Because think about it. If the king was going to eat something in his own room, Nehemiah is going to be there. If he's going to eat something at the end of the day while he's in bed, Nehemiah is going to be there. If he's going to eat something in the bathroom, Nehemiah is going to be there. Nehemiah is going to be near the king at all times. They form a very close relationship. Now, are you familiar with nepotism? Are you familiar with corruption? Are you familiar with this idea that when you get close to power, suddenly you're an avenue that you can influence for corrupt gain? It's very possible that anybody in any other kingdom that had this position could have used that position to say, Oh, king, here's another grape. Here's another grape. Here's another grape. Oh, I heard you needed a governor out in the outer province. You know, I know a guy. That's not wild to imagine, is it not? I mean, that's very normal. King, I heard this other guy's getting hanged. You know, I don't know. I, I, I've heard he's a really good guy, and he's a good friend of mine. That sort of, sort of stuff would have been very normal. In fact, we see that in another example that's very close to this story in the role of Esther, right? As the queen, as the queen she didn't, wasn't corrupt, but she used her position for influence, and she used it for good. Nehemiah could have been a very wealthy person just taking kickbacks from people saying, Hey, look, we need to pave a new road to the kingdom. We need to pave a new road to the palace. I know just the guy that can take care of that. And yet, Nehemiah, we find, is very, very devout in his relationship with God. It's almost as if Nehemiah is letting us know the tension between his role and his devotion. Now, I was a cupbearer to God. I was a cupbearer to the king, sorry. I was a cupbearer to the king. Are you catching some of the tension Nehemiah is seeming to insinuate with the fact of what I just did, this long prayer that is extremely devout, and the fact of my position? I was in a high place, and I was devout. You see, the very first thing that Nehemiah demonstrates for us is a sense of sensitive, intuitive, spiritually intuitive tenderness when it comes to his relationship with God. Now I was a cupbearer, comma, what's not spoken is, and yes, I still pray. Sometimes when we come to our relationship with God, we begin to distance ourselves from some of the more overt religious aspects of prayer and devotion and speaking about God in public because we feel that it makes us uncomfortable. You know, now that I'm the dad of the house, I don't want, I just feel weird praying in front of my family. Now that I'm over the age of 15, I feel weird praying out loud where other people can hear me. Why? Because I, I don't feel like I do it very well. I don't feel like I'm very good at it. I feel kind of awkward about it. Or we feel, you know what, now that I'm in this position of influence, I need to separate myself from my faith because I don't want to make anybody else feel uncomfortable. I don't want to make anyone feel weird about it. And yet here we find someone who self-describes himself, who self-describes as a cupbearer to the king, and yet they demonstrate incredible gentleness, tenderness, vulnerability with their faith. But we get into his prayer. We get into Nehemiah's prayer. A prayer that I would submit to you would be a prayer, would be a life, would be an approach that each one of us should model. You see, Nehemiah is given as the last figure of the Old Testament so that we might be the Nehemiahs of now. We look at Nehemiah and we say, man, we need a hero. We need someone to come through for us right now. We need Nehemiahs of now. We're, we need people that are willing to stand up to power and that are willing to lean into what needs to occur. We need Nehemiahs today. We need Nehemiahs now. The first indication of a now Nehemiah, the first mark of somebody that is willing to model the Nehemiah responsibility today, we see that Nehemiah had a clear understanding of the needs around him. A clear understanding of the needs around him. Look at verse 4. It says, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. 
As soon as I heard those words, as soon as the news reached me, as soon as it was told to me, I sat down and wept. Nehemiah was touched by the needs. Nehemiah was influenced. He was aware. He was touched by the needs around him. You see, so oftentimes today, we can be so removed from the things around us that we're not even aware of the needs. We've removed ourselves almost on purpose of the needs around us. How aware are you of the needs of your church? How aware are you of the needs of your home? How aware are you of the needs of your coworkers? Have you ever had the occasion where you're working and you're doing stuff at work and you have a buddy that sits in the cubicle next to you and you guys have gone and you've gone after work to, to grab some appetizers or you've gone to play paintball on the weekends or you maybe even had him over to your house to to show him the new car that you're rebuilding or whatever it might be and then one day at work he tells you hey Tom I don't know how to tell you this but Shirley and I are getting a divorce and it blows your mind you say what you and your wife are getting a divorce and then you say I had no idea yeah well yeah we are man I've been in that position where I felt flabbergasted to say, man, how was I so unaware of the needs that were so close to me, friends that were very dear to me, and they drop a bomb like that, and I say, man, now that I look back on it, I should have seen it all along. How aware are we of the needs of our families? Mom or dad says, we need to have a family meeting. We need to have a family meeting. And you get together in the living room and mom is sitting there and she says, you know what? I just need you guys to pick up after yourselves a little bit more. <laughs> and everybody stops and says, mom, why are you crying? I just need some more help around here. And mom, why are you crying? Because I've been asking you this for years and you're still not doing it. And you say, man... Why didn't you say something? <laughs> Being aware of what's happening in our homes. Obviously, that's an easy one. We can all think of all kinds of complex needs within marriage, needs within parenting. Are you making yourself aware of the needs in your household? You see, those needs don't often come up to you and bite you in the arm. Sometimes we need to ask questions. Is there anything that I can help with? Is there anything that's bothering you? No, nothing's bothering me. I'm feeling fine. But I say in general, dear, is there anything that I can do better? Is there anything that I can do that would make you happier? Is there anything that I could do that would make your life easier? Those are dangerous questions. They're dangerous for your wallet sometimes. But those are the kind of questions that make you more aware of what's happening around you. What about, are you aware of the needs of your church? Do you make yourself aware? There's a few of you that are so heavily involved, you know more about this church than you would ever want to know about anything else. But then there's some of the rest of us that sometimes make observations, critiques, insights, suggestions, and yet we're not aware of any of the needs of our church. Do we make ourselves aware of the needs and do we act as if we're aware? You see, Nehemiah is standing there. He's a very important person. His day consists of eating food so rich it's prepared only for the king. That's a good life. His life consists of being wherever the king is at. If people are brought in to entertain the, ki the king, dancing bears, whatever it might be, he gets to experience that as well. He lives in a gorgeous place with beautiful people all around him, whatever needs he has, and yet he still takes time to entertain, to make himself aware of the needs of his community, of his family. It says, my brother came to me and brought these needs. Scholars aren't exactly sure if that's his real brother or his brother in the Lord. But we have every indication to believe that maybe this was his real brother. This was his family coming to him and saying, Nehemiah, I know that you're all high and mighty in the palace nowadays, but I want to let you know what's happening back home. And he listens. He makes himself aware of their needs. 
the next mark of a Nehemiah of now, the next mark of, of our transformation to becoming the Nehemiahs of today, we find in verse 7. It says, in the middle of his prayer, he says, We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you're commanding your servant Moses. Now, when the problem is brought to Nehemiah, what is the problem describing? It's describing walls that have been torn down. And those walls exist where? I need to hear it better. Where, where do those walls exist? Jerusalem. And where is Nehemiah now? We saw it in verse 1. Where is he? He's in Susa. How many miles different is that? I'll tell you. It's 800 miles away. 800 miles away. Or the distance between Beaumont and El Paso. All within the same state, by the way. Here you have Nehemiah. He's 800 miles away from the problem. And he begins to use the first person plural pronoun to describe the problem. Do you notice the subtle shift there? What does he say there in verse 7? He says, We have acted corruptly. We have acted very corruptly against you and not kept this, the commandments, the statutes, the rules that you gave your servant Moses. We, we, we. Is Nehemiah back in Jerusalem? Did he do anything over there in Jerusalem? Has he ever even been there? We're not even sure if he's ever even been there. We're not even sure if he's ever even seen the place. And yet he begins to describe the problem as by saying, we, we, we. It'd be like saying, you know, we really need more aid and better bridges in Pakistan because we have these problems. And say, Albert, you've never even been to Pakistan. Why are you aligning yourself with these people? It's because Nehemiah saw the component of the problem that he could own, and he did so. You see, the second indicator of today's Nehemiah, the second indicator of becoming the Nehemiah that we need now, is that we own the part of the problem that we can. We look at the need and we see what part of that I can take care of, and we own it. You see, today... Oftentimes, you'll find me looking for whatever way I can distance myself from the problem. If I come in here and there's a mess on the floor, I'm going to say, well, it's because this ministry left a mess, or it's because that ministry left a mess. I took care of my stuff. It's me versus them. It's them that's the problem. It's not me. They need to take care of their stuff. Or if it's at home, I come home and there's a problem at the house, I say, well, it's because they did this, or, well, there's not a whole lot of they. It's me and her, but... I try and find a way to distance myself from the problem. Now, we don't have to look very far in the news to see people distancing themselves from the problem. You can only go back to the month of September of 2013 and there was a bridge. Mm -mm -mm. Several lanes of a bridge that was closed down and caused all kinds of problems up in the New Jersey, New York area. It caused thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of motorist problems. They couldn't get to work. They couldn't get to school. And now reports are coming out that people that were in a rush to get to the hospital, ambulances were stuck in this traffic. All because, according to the traffic authority, they were doing a study for the best placement of toll booths. But it smelled a little funny. Hmm. It smelled weird to everybody that was involved. Why would they do a study as to where the traffic toll booth should be at 9 a.m. in the morning? Why not do it at 1.30 in the morning? Why right during rush hour? And then all of these emails started to come to light where before the traffic study ever took place, people began to say, I think it's time for traffic problems in Fort Lee. No problem, I'll get right on it. And so now this whole discussion starts to come about, was there a conspiracy to cause this issue? And you can see people distancing themselves from this problem as much as is possible. And in fact, there's all of these layers, well, I, this is, that wasn't me that was talking, I was here, I was there. And they all want a phrase, they all want something that is very, very, very valuable in this moment. What is that? Plausible deniability. Oh, I wasn't involved with that. That's not me. That's their problem. I have fired the people that were involved with that problem. Let's move on. Let's talk about something else. I've taken care of it. Those people are gone. It's not me. It's them. It's not me. It's them. 
And you find Nehemiah here who's never been to the walls of Jerusalem. He's never so much as seen the walls of Jerusalem. And I dare to tell you he's never sinned near the walls of Jerusalem. And yet here he is taking what part he can to own the issue. Because he wants to beat himself before God? No. Because he's interested in the solution. You see, oftentimes when we as people come to a problem, we're more interested in assigning blame than we are into finding a solution. It comes to the way that we organize a church as well. We come to an issue where something goes wrong. Are we more interested in finding out who's at fault or what the solution is? Forget church. We do that at home. We do that at work. And here we have the example of, a ne of an individual, of Nehemiah, that we want to model for today. Nehemiah for now. Nehemiah looks at every problem. Case study this problem. And he says, what part can I own? Because the solution to this is bigger than who's at fault. He could have said, Lord, have mercy on those sinners at Jerusalem. Lord, find a way to minister to those people once you're done smiting them. But please, Lord, build those walls back up because they are a pack of sinners. No, he mourns because he wants a solution. He wants those walls to be built back up. And so he says, this is my part. Are you owning your part at home? Are you making it a spiritual discipline to own your part in every way that you can? Do you own your part in your prayer? Do you own your part when it comes to trouble at home? Let's say the trouble between you and your spouse is 90% their problem and 10% your problem. Let's just pretend that that is the case. Are you actively owning your 10%? Did you guys figure out which one of you is the 10, which one of you is the 90? I see several of you nodding your heads. Are you actively making it a spiritual, marital discipline to own your part? The Nehemiahs of now own their part of the problem so that they can move forward. Next up, the Nehemiahs of today are available to meet the needs themselves. A Nehemiah of today moves past that us versus them, moves past that me versus you, and moves to the place that says, what can I do? Not only have I owned what part I had in causing the problem, but I want to own my part in solving the problem. Look at verse 11. The Nehemiahs of today, Nehemiah prays, O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today. He doesn't say your servants. Your servant. He's speaking about who? He's speaking about himself. He says, God, give success to me in my endeavor. What's his endeavor? Oh, we're going to spend the rest of the book finding out about his endeavor. But give success to what I will attempt to do today, Lord, because there is a part in this that I feel that I can play. Lord, give success in my part. You see, the people of God that will bring lasting change to their marriages, people, that, people of God that will bring lasting effect to their communities, to their churches, are those that say, Lord, show me today what part I can play. Show me what part I can do. Lord, I want to make myself available. It's so easy to say my spouse will take care of it. My pastor will take care of it. My local head elders will take care of it. Somebody at my church will take care of it. Lord, what place can I have to rebuild the walls? Give me a brick, Lord. Help me to lay the first cornerstone of this wall. Lord, what part can I have? I've often been moved by families that have had all kinds of spiritual struggles in their homes relational struggles in their homes and I've been moved to tears as I've heard moms and dads talk about problems that they're having with their kids and about all the trouble that they've wanted to do to get their kids into 
into some sort of rehab or in some sort of restoration process and some sort of counseling. And it has moved my heart. I've never recommended this to anybody. And yet I've heard this from people saying, you know what? My son, my daughter might not be ready to go into counseling. But I'll go. I'll go into counseling for whatever part I can do to change to help this matter. Even if I'm only 1% of the problem. Do we want to be part of the solution? Do we want to be part of what happens in the change? Are we as parents looking to say, God, what part can I play? As a youth pastor, I often wondered why it was, even from my senior pastor's assessment, why it was that oft, it seemed like anything involving kids, youth and young adult, seemed to garner the more complaints from parents than any other area of the church. And I often wondered if it wasn't projection, if it wasn't sometimes over in Georgia, it would never happen here in Texas, if it wasn't sometimes parents looking for somebody to blame rather than their faults at home. It's so easy to blame the teacher. It's so easy to blame the pastor. It's so easy to blame that guy at church that causes trouble rather than to blame their own shortcomings as a parent. It's so much easier to blame that guy that's been leading my family astray or that woman that's been teaching my children all kinds of crazy stuff than to own what part you have fallen as a father or to own what part you as a mother have portrayed a picture of God that your children don't want any part of. The first step is saying, what part can I take as a member of the need to bring a solution? And then last, and not least, but central, is the fourth mark of a Nehemiah of today. We find it in verse 4. Verse 4, it says, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. What does continue mean? Continue means to continue to, to, to keep doing what you were doing, right? And so when he says, I began to weep and to mourn and to continue praying, it means that as soon as he heard these needs, he began to do several things. It says he began, as soon as he heard these needs, he sat down, he wept, he mourned, and he continued to do something. So that means that he did it right off of the bat. He weeps, he mourns, he sits down, and he prays. The mark of a Nehemiah of today is that they go to God first. They go to God first. They make God their first destination of the problem. If there's something in their life, when they get laid off, when they get blown off, when they get incensed, their first direction is to go to God first. Not to Facebook first. Not to your sister first. Not to your mother first. Not to your co-workers first. To God first. You see, he goes to God first because he knows that that's the only place he's going to find a solution to this problem. He says, God, I, I've, I have had a part to play. There's, this issue is intense, but God, I want to come to you first. I'm weeping, I'm mourning, and I'm praying to you as the very first thing that I can do. How often have I been guilty of coming across a problem and saying, you know what? Let me Google it. Or let me talk to some of my friends. Or even let me talk to my wife. My wife is an incredibly wise and intelligent person. But that doesn't replace God. And he begins to go through a prayer to God that outlines a way of prayer that we've talked about several times here at Stonehill. He begins first in verse 5 by saying, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant, steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. He begins to pray through this, this process of prayer which we've called here at Stonehill Acts, A-C-T-S. Some of us might be saying, you know, Albert, you talk a lot about prayer, but I feel so uncomfortable in prayer. I feel so foreign and awkward in prayer. And it sometimes is helpful to think of prayer as a little bit of a structure. A-C-T-S. Adoration. Confession. Thanksgiving and promises. 
supplication, otherwise known as my petitions, my wants. ACTS, and we begin to see Nehemiah go through this process loosely. Obviously, he wasn't familiar with ACTS, so we're not going to shove something onto him that he didn't know about. But we begin to draw out those parallels. First of all, he adores God. He begins by letting God know, God, you are above everything. You are wonderful. You're the Lord of heaven. You're the great and awesome God. Maybe we should begin our prayers by adoration, by adoring God, by showering more praise upon God before we move on to the next part. Verse 6 and 7. He says, Let your ear be attended and your eyes wide open. For the hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly. And he begins to confess. Because see, the act of confession, honest, vulnerable confession, moves you to a place where you're fighting war for blame and acknowledging what part you have to play. Confession. When's the last time you confessed something? I'm not saying something like, I confess that I love this TV show so much. I'm saying confess something that makes you vulnerable. Confess something that makes you uncomfortable. Confess something to God. Something about the dark recesses of your heart. Something about your doubts about Him. Confess something that makes you feel vulnerable. Adoration, confession. Verse 8. It says, Remember the words that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. He begins to acknowledge the promises that God has given his people. He begins to make references to scripture. Remember the promises that you gave to your people. Remember the promises that you gave to Moses. He begins to acknowledge the received word. Maybe scripture should have a place in our, bio, in our prayer time. Maybe you don't know what to say, but you can simply read a chapter from the psalmist David and say, God, that's me. Take David's prayer as mine. Adoration, confession, bringing in thanksgiving in Scripture. And lastly, verse 11, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servants today. Petitions, supplication, A-C-T-S, acts, Adoring, confessing, thanking God, acknowledging His promises, and then bringing our petitions to God. When's the last time you put yourself in a place where you needed God to act? When you put yourself in a place where you needed God to do something? Where you put yourself in a vulnerable place where you say, God, I need you. This problem is bigger than me. This problem is large. I'm in trouble. Lord, please act on my behalf. Because you are my God. You are my Father which art in heaven. Hallowed be your name. You see, the Nehemiahs of today begin to look at the story of this prophet from of old and we say, Lord, I want to be just like that. Lord, I want to act the way he acted. Lord, I want to come to you first. Lord, I want to make myself vulnerable. Lord, I want to accept the part of the problem that I have to play. I want to play less of the blame game and more of the confession from the heart game. And so today, as we have our praise team come up here, I want to introduce you to a, a slightly altered connection card that we're going to have for this sermon series. Our sermon series titled Nehemiah Restoring and Rebuilding. And we're going to look at so many different facets of restoration and rebuilding that Nehemiah is calling for our church and our hearts. But after each message, I don't want you to leave here without agreeing to, without committing to a next step. So if you take your connection card and look at the back, and you guys are going to look beautiful because I might have called you up here just a little early, but you guys look great. You look at the back here, and you see next steps. 
In light of what God has impressed upon my heart today, my next steps will be. Maybe God is impressing you that you need to take the next step of saying, God, I have stepped away from my reliance on your prayer connection first. And so today, in light of what you've told me, my next step will be to restore the lines of communication with God by making prayer the very first thing I do every day this week. I'm not talking about... I'm not talking about a time of devotions. I'm not talking about spending a time translating Hebrew to English for your devotion every day. I'm talking about your eyes open and you're committing to make your first thought a prayer. I talk about you committing this week to saying, God, before my feet touch the ground, I want to send up a prayer. Not a John chapter 17, Garden of Gethsemane prayer, just a prayer. God, I want to make it the first thing I do this week. Boom. That's my next step. Or maybe you say, you know what, I will choose one opportunity this week where I will intentionally persevere in prayer. That's longer than this first prayer. That's one time where you say, God, I want to persevere in prayer. Here we find Nehemiah praying verse after verse after verse after verse, persevering on one issue. Do you have a prayer list? Do you have children that you want to pray for? Do you have a church that you want to pray for? Do you have a spouse that you want to pray for? Lord, I feel called, based on what the pastor has impressed upon my heart today, that my next step is I'm committing to persevere at least once in prayer. I'm going to pray, I'm going to get tired and sick of it, and I'm going to pray a couple more minutes. I'm going to get bored with it and daydream, and then I'm going to pray another minute or two. I'm going to persevere. That's my next step. Next step, I'm going to commit to joining my prayers with God's other servants at least once this week. You see it there in verse 11. Nehemiah says, Lord, help us. Make me successful, but help us. When's the last time you joined your prayers with somebody else? This coming Wednesday night, we have our prayer meeting where we put our arms around each other and we beg God on behalf of each other. Maybe your next step is to say, God, this is where I need to be. I'm committing to making prayer meeting a part of my week. Putting my arms around my family and being lifted up in prayer. This week, 7 o'clock Wednesday, that's my next step. Or maybe you say, you know what? I simply want to recommit my life to God for today. Or seek God for the first time. Commit to God while we sing this song what your next step will be. Fill it out. Put it in the offering plate as it goes by. It's a way of making tangible what's happening in here. Oftentimes, we don't really do something until we feel like we've committed to it before God. This is a way of making tangible what can sometimes be ephemeral and easily forgotten in here. Let's sing this song together as we commit to God.